start in terms of a bit of an introduction about this. Um, um, thank you for coming along. It is the last session of the conference, but at least it's not 5 or 6 p.m. You know, often the last se session is much later than 3 p.m., so, so I've been quite lucky from that point of view. Um, I'm Joe Fountain, and um, I'm sort of the facilitator, i.e. just introducing this. Oh, excellent timing. Um, uh, the idea for this session probably came um, through a number of discussions I've had over the years with various people on this panel and other people in the room. Um, in terms of um, what is, when we research wine tourism, when we talk about the wine tourism experience, what exactly are we talking about? And I've had many occasions when I'm talking to people from other parts of the world, and I realise that what I'm thinking of in my head when they say wine tourism is quite different from the thing they're talking about. So, um, so Michael and I uh, at the end uh, um, met at a conference in uh, Dunedin in New Zealand in February, and we were sort of having this discussion about um, is, is there a difference between old and new world? Is that where the difference lies? Is the difference to do with the the, the um, elements of the experience? So we just thought it was a good opportunity for us to have a bit of a discussion about this. So the panel we've pulled together here represents um, you know, what we loosely call the old world and the new world. It also represents um, members of the panel who have extensive experience of both the old world and new world. Um, so um, just in terms of who we have here, um, for those of you who haven't seen me in one of my two or three other presentations, um, I'm Jo Fountain, I'm from Lincoln University in New Zealand. Uh, my background is um, I've been a tourism researcher for about 15 years and started working in wine tourism when I lived in Western Australia and uh, Steve was actually in the office opposite me. So that was my introduction to wine tourism. Um, I've also had the fortune to be in Burgundy for three months doing wine tourism research. And so I have a mix of experience between the old and new wine region. Starting, um, we're not sitting in any particular order, at the other end we've got um, Michael Conlon. He's a professor at the Okanagan School of Business. Um, probably quite new to sort of wine tourism research, but is a wine lover, um, <laughs> which is an important criteria here. Um, and also has done quite a lot of research in kind of industrial and heritage tourism. So he's kind of coming from that perspective. Um, next along the line, uh, most of you will know Steve Charters, um, a Master of Wine prof Professor of Marketing, uh, obviously originally British, then Australian, now living in France, so an extensive experience of you know, wine regions and wine tourism experiences around the world. Uh, and then we've got Albert uh, Stockel from um, Austria. Uh, who again is bringing to us an older world experience, but you've also been in Australia. So, so again, we've got that comparison. And here at the end, last but not least, second on the list, um, is uh, Natalia Velikova, um, another colleague I've worked with who originally was from Ukraine, now living in Texas, uh, but having recently fulfilled a Fulbright in Georgia. <coughs> Georgia, Europe, not Ireland. So, so anyway, so, so the idea of this um, session is really it is about uh, participation. Uh, I think we would all agree that we haven't done a huge amount of discussion about what the content's going to be beforehand. Um, we have got, um, we basically set three broad questions. Um, and the questions are, um, so what is the core of the wine tourism experience? Um, and then a question that sort of specifically interested me um, was around the role of heritage and tewa in the wine tourism experience. My experience was that the old world was very different from the new world in terms of the emphasis on that. Um, and then the third question is more around um, what do tourists seek or expect from wine tourism? And do you think that differs between the old world and the new world? Are, are tourists seeking different experiences when they go to Bordeaux versus um, Barossa? Uh, so the way it's going to work is that um, one of the panel members is going to start answering each one of these questions. So Albert may, not, may or may not be aware that he's starting with the first question. <laughs> <laughs> because you left the room, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I think you, for what you've said you want to talk about, um, you know, what is the core of wine tourism experience, should wine be the core of that experience, and then I'll let the other panel members on each question add their bit, and you know, please feel free to add insights from the audience as well. 
Um, and then uh, Steve will start on the second question as the first sort of go on second question, and then Natalia will start on the third question. So that's kind of very loosely how we're going to run it. Um, so um, if um, I will, Albert, uh, Albert has prepared some some slides as well, so I now need to put his slides up. So if you want to, just, um, did you want that as well? So the first question is, yeah, just what are some thoughts you have about the nature of the wine tourism experience? What's important um, and how does it differ? So the, the colleagues, the friends that know me for years know that I dedicated my um, doctoral thesis to the topic of wine tourism and we did uh, questionnaires which we gave out in 14 different wine regions in seven different countries and the answer to the question is yes there's a huge difference between different regions uh, only looking at tourists profiles where they come from um, tells us that there are very few regions uh, in the world and especially in Europe that would attract international visitors. Whereas regions in Austria such as the Wachau, which only people know that really dedicate a lot of time to wine, have more or less locals going there. So people come from Vienna, people come from Linz, and you might find Germans, because Germans are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very nice story about the Colomé winery in Argentina. We arrived there after six hours of driving. We were exhausted, and there was a happy German and say, oh, that was not so far. So, <laughs> so but generally spoken, there's a huge difference. We have to um, differentiate between uh, wine regions that have a real big international um, standing, such as Bordeaux, Champagne, Burgundy, then there are, I think, two in Italy, which is the Piedmont and Tuscany. Um, and there are new world wine regions um, where the prestige of the wine is so high that coming from Europe, we would be there standing with our mouths open. Like, for the prices that people pay, for the efforts they take uh, into account to get there, and for the money they pay for overnight stays and so on. So in countries, in wine growing countries that are tradition, traditional wine growing countries in, in Europe, I think the drink wine is way too trivial to make such a story about it. We have to provide a story to make people come, but the product wine itself is too trivial. It's first of all cheap, it's just another drink. It's either buying a beer uh, in the in the restaurant you go to for 330 or in Krems the average glass of white wine is 1 euro 80 so you get a glass of 1 euro 80 or you get a beer for 330 and it's just another drink it's too tri trivial so that people think a lot about it and the next big differentiation point of many other countries and Austria Germany is the tradition of wine taverns that are basically tax-free. They are called Heurigen or Buschenschank or in Germany Straßenwirtschaft or the Busch, uh, how do you call them? Besen. And you can get a plate of food for 450. And what are the guys going there? Are they 450 charcuterie plate tourists or are they wine tourists? Of course, everybody that offers these things are wineries because they have the tax opportunity if they produce a small amount of wine that it's an all-in tax opportunity they can take that's why what they give out to their guests is so cheap and everybody would walk out a Heuring or Buschenschank or Besen with a carton of wine under the arm because they come there and, and carrying them up they come there to eat cheap food to drink a few glasses of wine which is so trivial that we even add soda so sparkling water to it, it's the most popular drink in a basin or a hiring in Austria. So it's a <coughs> refreshing thing. It's nothing you swill around 10 times. It's a good wine, but you add sparkling water and you just drink it. Then you buy something for taking it home. So the level and the different styles of wine tourism differ so significantly from each other that we're actually talking about 
whole different things. That's my point of view. I wanted to show you um, a bit of, well, the numbers here. Um, that's to compare a little bit old and new world um, you know, numbers. You know what the first number is? 323 million? And 510 million? So it's the inhabitants of the US and the inhabitants of the EU. The other number here? Minus UK. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> the other number, <laughs> approximately 20 million and approximately 200 million are the liters of wine. Not 200, 20. 20? 20 million and 200 million. Yeah. Approximately. Yeah. Sorry, I yeah. said it wrong, I think. So that's the amount of wine produced. You see, um, it would be if we plant California to Europe and we wipe out all other wine regions, then we would have the same picture, more or less. So it's also such a hype, I think, here, and so sophisticated to go to Napa, Sonoma, because it has kind of uniqueness compared to the 10 times bigger choice that you have all, all over Europe with only a few prestigious regions. But the numbers already, I think, tell us a lot. And the next thing, you don't have to really see what's written on these tables, but these are the number of overnight stays that we have in the top wine communities in Austria. The only important thing is this number. We have 1.4 million overnight stays. And who saw my presentation yesterday, we have 14 million overnight stays in Vienna and 135 million overnight stays in Austria. So the biggest wine communities all together per year make 1% of the overnight stays. So it's a niche market. Our big market is mountains, skiing, hiking, perhaps bicycle, you know, mountain biking. But it's basically nothing. It's unimportant. And another thing that I wanted to show, these are then uh, countries about culinary tourism. We really, in Austria, want to go away from the concept and even the wording wine tourism. We want to approach it to culinary tourism because we don't have a law that would forbid us to serve food with the tasting. We can do it, and mostly people go eating and have a glass of wine or spritzer with it, and not the other way around. And so when we ask, this is a sample of 1,000 Germans and Austrians, and it is really representative because, it's, because it was done by a research institute. We paid money for that. So you see, they're uh, not interesting at all versus very interesting. And the bad news is alcoholic beverages for the average person, the John Doe in Germany and Austria, are the least important things. So when I have to give an advice to old world wine growing regions, combine it with other foods. And then you have the experience that normal people look into and are interested in. I always take the example, get a company, and the company field trip is very popular in Austria. If you have a bus with 100 people, you have one or two wine freaks that would go through a tasting of 10 different wines. All the others would say after the second wine, OK, can we go now? <laughs> Yeah. I talked a lot. I'm yeah, sorry. That's fine. That I wanted to make this point, and that's a huge difference to prestigious wine regions in France and Italy, and to totally different from the New World. Okay, so there's a few ways we can go there. I think one of the interesting things about that was this kind of food and wine experiences. Uh, Natalia, did you want to talk I about that? I just want to add a little bit. Um, we have a PhD student who did a study. Uh, it was not in the, it was not done. In, it was a qualitative study, and it was not done in Napa, Sonoma. It was done um, not in Texas, but in other states. 
and it was on the supply side and then she also talked to the consumers so she kind of combined and she came up with the, what she called the magic of six and she her idea is and she's trying to develop this as a theory for her for her um, dissert PhD dissertation, but her idea is you need to have six businesses to make an overnight state. So, because people don't want to visit six wineries in one day, it's impossible, or even in two days. And after a while, it's kind of like, if you haven't been shopping for, for a house, they, you come home and you're like, okay, what was that house with the bathroom, you know? And it's like, they all start to, you know, to merge together. And so um, she, her, her findings was that you have to have six businesses to work together, the magic of six, she calls it, to create that overnight experience, which are food, local cheese, like all of those, but not just wine-centered. That's to her, yeah, but she's, she's focusing on more culinary plus wine tourism, kind of just to add to what you were saying. Okay, thank you. Steve, did you have, uh, uh, do you have any different things <coughs> in terms of what's... I, I, look, I, I always write that the outworking of wine tourism is fundamentally different in completely different regions around the world, even within France, it's different. Um, but I think you can still ask if there isn't a core of wine tourism that identifies wine tourism as being having the same functional functions around the world. So I, I, I make a difference between the, the core of wine tourism and the way it's, it operates in different places. Um, and that seems to me, at the risk of sounding trite, that the core of wine tourism is hospitality. Wherever you are, you are providing hospitality. That is a fundamental thing. Now, and that comes with an awful lot of implications with it. Um, the other thing, and again, it, even more of the risk of being tried, is that wine is involved. <laughs> okay, so it's something around hospitality and wine, and that's true wherever you are. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I think, and I suspect we will spend a lot of time then saying how does it differ in different parts of the world, and we can, you know, we can go into that in some detail. But I think that's the comment I'd make at that point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Oh. No, I, I was going to say, I mean, it may then be that there are such differences between parts of the world, but I would place them as being more general than the ones Albert does, mm -hmm. which says that, in fact, you can't categorise wine tourism as being the same, um, because hospitality, hospitality and wine aren't enough on their own. Um, I'd be interested to hear other views mm -hmm. on, on that issue, or maybe you can say, yeah, actually, wine tourism is, is the same. I'm sorry, Michael. No. So inter interestingly enough, uh, I've, I've, I've been provided with uh, the results of some uh, research, uh, some um, commercial research that's been done by the BC Wine Institute, which is headquartered in Bona. Uh, it hasn't even been published yet, so don't go scrambling on the Google looking for it. Uh, but basically, it's a survey, two different levels of surveys of uh, uh, people who call themselves wine tourists who come to the Okanagan and what it is they're looking for and why they choose the Okanagan and so on and so forth. And uh, my colleagues have actually described it spot on. I mean, I was expecting to hear something quite different, but it's exactly that. So. Uh, um, in the case of the open open, for example, the number two thing they list are restaurants after wine. And then after that, they list a whole series of other things, none of which have anything to do with restaurants or wine. Mm -hmm. But they are all, they all perceive themselves as being wine tourists. Mm -hmm. So as, as I've quite often said to, to some people anyway, uh, to me it's more of a destination management thing. It's, it's much broader, I think, than just wine. I know I shouldn't say that in a venue like this, but I, <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. yeah. you know, I, think, yeah. I think it is. I think there's also differences. I mean, the fact that there's food and wine thing, I know in the States, you can't, wineries can't have restaurants. And so for many parts of the world, you're what? No, yeah. that's not true. It's yeah. just... Yeah. But yeah, well, in some, I think, Texas, can you have restaurants? Well, you, you have to have a different license, which, which is a completely different business, to serve food at your premises, which is a completely different business. So and most wineries don't want to go. It's the opposite in New York. You have yeah. to have food at your premises. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it just goes to show you the see, You can see how. I think it goes to show the kind of levels of sort of um, legislative and regulatory. Yeah. So, same in New Zealand, but, you know, if you want to serve. If you want to charge for a tasting, you can't charge for a tasting unless you serve food. Mm. You can only serve food if you have a commercial license. Mm. 
to sit with it. And to have a commercial license, you need a commercial kitchen. <laughs> so, and, and some people get around that by saying, well, actually, we're not serving you for the wine, we're serving, you know, it's the hospitality or the service we're charging for. Um, but again, it just shows that actually, you know, digging below the surface, there are all these other issues. Um, and again, that point, I remember seeing some research in Margaret River when I lived in WA. And, you know, when you ask people at wineries, I think maybe it was Steve's research, when you ask people, people at wineries why they are in Margaret River number three is to visit wineries so these after the forests and the surfing so actually even those who are at wineries aren't I, I think this is fundamental as well. <coughs> Tourists, no, no one sees themselves as wine tourists, I was about to it, say. except us. People are tourists. Yeah. And Margaret River is a, a classic example of that. It's a great Australian wine region, but there are other things to do. Even, and there's probably, there may be Burgundy people, just certainly Champagne, there's nothing else to do in Champagne except drink Champagne. <laughs> um, but, but there's very few regions, I think, where you go just for the wine. The other thing that we haven't mentioned, and we've talked about, you know, and Albert's list all the, all the classic places where you go for the wine because they're so well known. Um, Burgundy is one. You go over the, the uh, River Sone and you're in the Jura, where they make lovely wine. But no one goes there for the wine. No one knows the wines. They go to the Jura for cheese and for walking and hiking and the outdoor activity. Um, and I think it's too easy for us to think about wine tourism in the context of this is a famous place for wine as opposed to wine is a component. And it may be um, a big component of the tourism offer. It may also be a small but in, a component, but still important for the local wine industry. Alan, you hear that? Well, I think one of the key differences, if you want to talk about old world or new world uh, wine, are not so much the regions themselves, but it's the tourists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the degree to which wine uh, plays a, a role in their motivation for travel. Uh, in, in Kelowna, even though we think of ourselves as Canada's second biggest wine region, uh, wine as a, as a tourism activity is always, well, almost always, and also rent. They come to do something and then, oh, hey, there's wineries. That's cool. Let's go try one. Kind of thing is, is sort of that. So we, we look at, you know, I mean, in, in terms of the wine tourists, uh, you know, continuing between sort of novices and experts and uh, the degree to which uh, those people get involved in tour uh, wine tourism as the core activity that they do. Uh, but I think if someone goes to Burgundy or Champagne, the wine experience is going to be a much more significant motivator for the, for the trip. So it's, it's, it's not just the region, but it's, it's the, the nature of the tourist that it needs. I, I think it's definitely parts of Burgundy. I think, you know, Bone, for example, definitely wine tourism, but you don't need to go to well, Burgundy. It's mm -hmm. wine, food, and culture, and heritage. Yeah. It's three main reasons. But it's the sweet and wine. That's a nice segue into the second question. Yeah, I knew it would be. Maybe one. I just got a couple of other comments. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think I, I picked up on an important word is activity, because when you start talking about premier locations, then you're talking about your destination, tourism. Yeah. But otherwise, if it's an also run, that means that it's an activity. And selling that experience or selling that activity becomes just basically part of a, something else whether or not you're combining it with buying wine or you're combining it with doing something else first, you know, being on business here and going out to a, tonight to dinner at a winery. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and an extension of that also from this, some of these studies that were done. Um, uh, the, the, the people surveyed were in Washington, Alberta, and British Columbia, which is the primary market from where we come from. And, uh, they all cited water. Well, virtually everybody cited water as an important thing. So either a view of the ocean or a view of a lake. So that explains if you saw the map of Kelowna, which our colleague showed uh, in the last presentation, virtually all the wineries are along the lake with views of the lake. Uh, and so many of the people have said that views of water were important to them, as well as outdoor activities and restaurants. And views of water are also important for the grapes. <laughs> Uh, there's an area here that um, most Californians ignore, I think, entirely, <laughs> maybe for a good reason. But it's, it's from uh, Michigan and Minnesota uh, all the way down to Texas. And there's about 50 million people in there. And when they go to wineries, that's it. That's the primary tourist spot. There isn't much else in their neighborhood that's really interesting. 
Uh, so there is sections where, if you're really in a boring region and everything, where uh, you know tourism becomes the primary uh, activity. You know. So I guess some of these other places are blessed with a whole range of other things as well. Right. So right, again, yeah. it comes down to the specificity. Cool. I am just aware, a bit aware of the time. So, um, but the, the second question does tie into actually what Laurent said about. Burgundy and what are the reasons people go to Burgundy um, and you know, culture, heritage, wine and food. Um, I know that was my experience when I was interviewing there. So, so this is the next question really. I mean, is, this, is the issue around heritage and te, uh, tewa, is that something that sets apart the experiences of wine tourism? So Steve... I don't really want to ask that question because I think we've done it. <laughs> um, I think there's more interesting things to say. I mean, I, I think what we've established, and I think this is quite clear from the literature, I, I don't think heritage is the key, but wine links into so many other things. If you like wine, you normally like good food. You might be interested in history. You might be interested in outdoor activity. You might be interested in architecture or art or whatever. Um, and the kind of people who will be wine tourists amongst other forms of tourists look for other things. I think that's important. I think, what's, I think the terroir issue is quite interesting. I think it links into something else, though, that I, I think is relevant to this. We've talked a lot about what tourists are looking for and how tourists may differ in different parts of the world. Uh, or I'm, I'm cautious about how big those differences are. Um, one thing that interests me is what the providers think they are doing and how that differs in different parts of the world. If you go to small producers in France, certainly, I don't know what it's like in Austria, Albert can comment on this. If you go to small producers in France um, who will open their doors for people to come in and taste wine, um, which is therefore a hospitality activity, it goes back to what I was saying about hospitality, um, they do not believe they are engaged in wine tourism. Wine tourism is what a big company does where they have sellers to tour and people go around there. And okay. generally have t fees as well. And possibly fees. Um, so th that, is, that is what tourism is. In the mind of most providers of wine tourism in volume terms, in France, certainly in Champagne and Burgundy, which are the two regions I, I know best. Um, and I think in other parts, a lot of other parts of Europe as well, but the minute you open your door, that is wine tourism. Um, so I think that is a, that's a really interesting difference that could be explored a lot more. Um, this links in part, again, it links into terroir. It's not a, 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 a irrelevant. Because the focus of these people is very much on what they do. They make the wine and they want to sell it. it selling wine is, for them, not the same as tourism or hospitality. But what they are doing is selling... Uh, a part of their identity, which is a part of their place, which is their terroir. Now, I'm not so sure that there's a bit as big a difference between old world and new world here as people might think. I think a lot of uh, new world wine tourism providers and wine producers are very focused on where they are. Whether that is the precise uh, structure of the land and the soil that they've got, or their precise, precise mesoclimate, or the exposure of their grapes, it's a slightly different issue, but I think it's about where they are placed geographically and the identity of their community, the history of their community, how they got there, the story that they have to tell about why they're in this place and not in another place. Um, and ultimately, um, I think, I, I, we don't want to get into an argument about what terroir is here, this is the wrong venue for that. Um, but ultimately, um, I think that's what a lot of European wine producers who are engaged in promoting their wines are doing. So, I mean, that's all I want to say. I want to hear what other people have to say about this. I'm not going to answer your question in any more detail. That's fine. Um, does anyone else on the panel have something to add about what Well, Tewara or Heritage or, you know, what it is they're selling beyond the wine at wineries. Well, you know, websites have a section that say about us often, you know, and you, well, our story. I, I can make a comment about something that's uh, quite uh, specific to the Okanagan, which is <clears throat> we're, we're fond of uh, promoting the fact that we have two Aboriginal wineries, and we believe that nowhere else in the world is there such a thing. Is that? No, there is in New Zealand. Is that? Okay. <laughs> so the question, the question then, is it a real Aboriginal winery? Because the Aboriginal wineries in the Okanagan, one is owned, I just found out at lunchtime, by the Ontario Teachers Union uh, Investment Trust. Uh, and the other one is owned by uh, a local chief who just actually is right below me. Um, 
the one, the one that's owned by the, the chief who, who set it up as a business, he has absolutely set it up as a business. It's called Indigenous Wines. I have no idea why people go there, but the menu has a sort of indigenous food on it. There's not much of that. It's sprinkled throughout a, a fairly ordinary menu. Uh, and his wine, he just purchases and he bottles and he puts labels on that have uh, labels that we can't pronounce and so on and so forth. Uh, and out front, I wish I could have had a photograph of this, he has four or five gigantic wigwam frames with um, uh, lighting, like you know, the string lighting all around them, which I didn't think seemed very traditional. Well, when you go to the south end of the valley, there's another one called Incomi, which is the one that's now owned by the Teachers Union out of Ontario. Uh, but at the very least, they try to introduce some of their culture to it, because to get to it, you have to go past what is a fairly magnificent cultural center, which is part of the whole complex. Um, but the, the irony, of course, of all of this, and it's a total paradox, is there is no uh, alcohol consumption tradition amongst the Aboriginals anyway. So it's, it's purely yeah, it's purely commercial. Yeah. I guess an example I had of something similar was um, in New Zealand recently. There was um, a winery that at its cellar door I noticed had a lot of little uh, kind of hand woven stuff on the wall, little. Um, uh, uh, pegs, clothes pegs on a little string with little f family photos and stories of coming to this winery in this region and how we fell in love with the place and here's the family and here's the children and here's the dog and you know very sort of rustic. Um, I found out after visiting that cellar door, you know, um, I found that it's 50% owned by Gallo. <laughs> so I think it's a similar kind of thing, you know, to the story of heritage and about us and about place um, is often quite complicated. Um, yeah, so the, the, the rest of you do, you, do you have any other comments around? So, um, I think that less known regions throughout Europe, they're doing a very, very bad job <laughs> in wine tourism. Um, first of all, the people who run a winery are not interested that tourists come. They just rob their time. You know, the ones like me stepping into a winery, I will discuss with him one hour and a half, try the whole range, and then buy a carton of six wines. That's a waste of time. He has much yeah. more important things to do. So what they do in Austria and also in Germany, they buy these visitor centers, uh, which they call Gebiet's Vinothek. It's a regional wine shop where people can go, do the tasting. They can also then charge fees because if you tell an Austrian who enters a winery the tasting is $20 or, or 50 or 60 like here, zzz, buy. No one would pay these amount of money. If it's five euros, perhaps okay. But these visitor centers, they, they charge and people accept it. And the tourists who come do not, you know, consider, uh, take the whole time from the winemaker. So we have the basic idea, the winemakers are not looking into receiving tourists in their regions. Secondly, where they built this Gebietswinotheken, the regional wine shops in Austria, is ridiculous. They are on the Czech border, on the Hungarian border, on the Slovakian border, on the Slovenian border. So. It used to be the end of the world, of the Western world. A <laughs> uh, bit the same in Germany and other countries. Why don't we go there where the tourists already are? When we have more than 30 million overnight stays in Tyrol, in the mountains, why don't we build there a wine tasting center and have the tourists there? For sure there is one day where they can't go skiing or they, the legs are hurting and then they say, you know, there's a wine tour. When I go to Berlin, I want a German wine tourism center and I want to taste wines from Württemberg and Pfalz and regions are not so well known and discover their food also. It's not that I visit Berlin and then I take three days time to visit the wine regions. Berlin has incredible number of tourists, it's amazing. And in Madrid they have it, they have a Spanish wine house, but nobody knows about it, so they don't promote it properly. And we should go where the tourists are and tell the story there. Of course, a good side effect would be then they really come to Jura or other, but you can tell the story of Jura also in Paris where you have millions of tourists. 
And that's what I've tried to promote for years now, but nobody's listening I guess except what, you. I think, you know, yeah, I would go to Denver. I think one of the issues with that, though, is I know that in a lot of wine regions, being able to, I know the winemakers will say, being able to taste the wine and point out the vines where they are grown is a really important connection between the wine tourism experience and, to, and seeing where the vines are is quite important. So that, yeah. An example of, of a place that's doing just that is Washington State. So most of the vineyards are actually in the eastern part or like the two-thirds of the eastern part and yet and you see Woodenville which is right outside Seattle, right? So Seattle is where everyone's going and uh, there's the water. I mean you've got so much in Seattle and so Woodenville is, is this area where you're just seeing more and more wineries have their tasting rooms, not necessarily their wineries, and some are combined and everything, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're going to where the tourists are so they get that exposure, and they'll also probably have a, a tasting room, you know, out the Ekema Valley and all these different places, but they are concentrating there because that's where the people are. Okay. Don, Don, Donna's been trying to get in. Yeah, no, I, I saw Donna was the Look, I'm moving backward, though, to a couple of conversations oh, ago. Right. And, and something you were talking about with the, the close tags and, and all of that. And something I've asked myself a lot is, is what's the role of authenticity in this whole thing? Because, it, and it, I don't just mean that, but I'm thinking of you know, wineries that make traditional methods, sparkling wine, which is what we can call champagne when we're not in champagne. Um, there we go. No. <laughs> uh, at any rate, and, and you know, you know, in the back, they've got these, you know, very sophisticated ways of riddling this wine, and yet in the tasting room, there's this lovely old wooden riddling rack, and it, it, you know, it appears that someone goes out and does the quarter turn, you know, by hand for all of their bottles. But there's that. There's this sort of backstage front stage idea as well and the wineries that create uh, a fake backstage for want of a better way of putting it and there are practical considerations why you want to do that yeah and you know right. safety and health considerations and all of that plus productivity Probably. but how how concerning are these people visiting and, and at what point do we cross a line where it's not authentic anymore and people start to care and, I mean Many of us would walk in and notice that, wait a minute, this doesn't seem quite right. Um, I'm not sure how discerning the, the people we are calling wine tourists, because I take the point entirely that we, we put that label on them, they may not take that on themselves. This and this is danger to generating into a 20 minute rant on authenticity. I think this is a really good question. And it actually goes back to something that, that Albert was saying as well that I'd like to comment on if I'm allowed that amount of time. Um, but I mean, the first thing, what is authenticity? But, I, I mean, that quite um, genuinely, because there's been a lot of work done within marketing on what is authentic. And, the general idea is that authenticity is a social construct. Having said that, in wine, it can manifest itself in all kinds of ways, which may be about production, or about land, or about family tradition, um, or about artisanality, a whole range of things. And you can be authentic in New Zealand because you're environmentally sound, and you can be authentic in France because your family's been making wine for 500 years. Okay? Um, now, we all know that the, the companies that portray one idea of authenticity when they're doing it differently uh, behind the scenes, and without wishing to um, promote uh, um, a lack of veracity or tricking their customers, what you're doing in the end is telling a story. We've talked a lot during this conference about stories, but why tourism is no different. You've got, to, you've got to tell a story and you've got to bring your customer in on the story and the customer's got to go away infused by the story. And that actually leads me to go back to what Albert was saying, and I, I'm slightly worried about what you're saying about what's happening in Austria. And you're right, the starting point, look, it's a waste of someone's time spending half an hour or an hour with you and you buying two bottles or something. I mean, that, that's not good economics. But what you're doing with wine tourism, you're giving an experience, you're giving an authentic, in inverted commas, experience. So they can go away and say, I want to buy this wine in the future. And a tasting room where the number of different wines on has got to be really well handled to do that. And I fear that you lose that opportunity to sell 
your vision, your your idea, your 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 being, if you like, as a winemaker to your customers, so you win them for life. And I mean, most of the research says that when someone is a wine tourist. The quality of wine is not the most important thing. I and mean, there's so much evidence on this. It is the quality of the experience. Um, and the wine cannot be bad, but consumers don't generally have the ability to distinguish between adequate, good, very good, excellent, world class wine. They can't do that. And I mean, most of us who are good wine tasters may find that hard in the environment of a cellar door. So don't give them bad wine, but beyond that, you give them a, a good experience. And so, I, I, there's a logic to what you're saying, and I'm not completely against it. I think that these tasting rooms can do a good job, but I'm, I'd be concerned they'd lose the experience. So I've tried to answer two questions, but Don, I'm really happy to discuss this further with you later, actually, because it's a fascinating topic. And I noticed that... The authenticity thing is really interesting. In, in, in the Okanagan, um, we're, we're about a 200-mile-long valley, and you were talking about being able to hold the glass and point out the window and say that's where the grape comes from. I think tourists have that sort of estate winery expectation wherever they go. But most of the wineries in the Okanagan don't provide that experience. The grapes of the window are not generally made in the wine in a lot of cases. They're just yeah, going exactly. to be there. Well, actually, that's often enough. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, when you say a point to where they go, we're doing research in the fall on does that add value to the tourism experience? So we're looking at using GIS systems and mapping to show these are the vineyards that went into this bottle. Uh, my initial conversations with wine tasting room staff are that hey, it takes too long and beat. Nobody cares. It's from the Okanagan. That's good enough. Uh, and the Vintners Quality Association that we have in Canada is interesting because it's for wines of marked quality. But what the what the uh, board does is not that the wine is good, but that the wine is not bad, which is a very different thing. <laughs> Yeah, no fault. It's not going to damage the reputation. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, good is such a subjective thing. Yeah. Bonnie? Yeah, I, my head's spinning because I keep feeling like we're having two conversations. One about distribution channels and retailing, and one about developing an attraction story. And it, it just feels like we're, we're still stuck on, on who we are. Are, are. are we developing a place people are just coming to buy wine, or are we truly, fully embracing tourism? Because I've been in tourism for 33 years. And you know, when you start looking at developing attraction, be it Disney, be it whatever, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And people, I, I, I guess in, in my small part of the world, in North Carolina, I sit down with people and I say, if you really want to go the, the tourism route, you really have to think that you're developing an attraction. You're not just trying to you know, open up a shop, here's a window, here's, I'm going to sell you wine, and you're going to come to my door and lower my distribution costs. One of the best quotes that I got from uh, one of the Texas winemakers, I asked him, what's the most surprising thing that you found out once you started your winery? And he said, I never realized I was in the entertainment business. So, that's good. I, I'm aware of, uh, okay, <laughs> this, this may be more than we can do. <laughs> we did ask for an hour. It, 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 it may be an, an, an inappropriate question or remark anyway. Is there anybody in this room who could describe your own personal favorite winery and tell us why and having it be a place that we would go to again and again? I see there's two different issues there, because there's one, I mean, I know that Steve and I have done some research on mystery shopping where we started our wine tourism research, and we actually found that people's favourite wineries were not necessarily ones that they would want to go back to. So you ask them what their favourite experience was, and it was almost always a small boutique establishment with interesting wines and a great engagement with a winemaker, but if you ask them which one they'd go back to, they would go back to the bigger winery that had more to offer, that had a restaurant, that had events where you could go and have a picnic. So 
So does that imply that it's a once in a lifetime experience? Well, like you, you can have I think for that small winery, a lot of it is the sense of discovery, mm. right? And once you've discovered it, you can go back and discover that, that same winery again. Right? Yeah, okay. so yeah. I think that's some aspect about not wanting to go back to your favorite experience. Yeah. I think it relates to hospitality and exactly what you were talking about. Because if you go to, uh, and it's age related too, if you take the 20s, 30s something in Oregon, and Washington State, they love to go to McMinivan's, which is uh, a, a large uh, lodge that's inexpensive to uh, stay at and has a brewery, a uh, distillery, and a, a large winery there. So it's a, it's a three ring circus plus all sorts of music venue and, and free uh, movies upstairs. So they, they go there, the locals in, in the Tri-State area go there for the weekend quite often. This is a, this is a great uh, hospitality venue. I also believe that um, going back to wineries is also to actually meet the winemaker and to, uh, to get in contact again with the person who can have a nice relationship with this person, with the winemaker. How, how Which she is yeah. making the wine. Mm -hmm. Which again connects that idea of hospitality and making a connection with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, in, Bur in Burgundy, the people, yeah. yeah, in Burgundy they definitely do that. You know, the, the interviews we did, there were people who said, you know, these people who come and our, our customers now, they they came as children with their parents, and so there is an ongoing, long-term kind of relationship established. Jennifer, I saw I, would, I would say in Virginia, I mean, I, I could do that. One of my favorites. I actually go back every year, and I was a a barrel owner. Um, you don't really wine enough, but like and. And I would do potluck picnics with friends there all the time and do events. And, and I did happen to know the winemaker. He was very prevalent there. But I rarely saw him when I go back. And that's not why I go back. And, and I do think Virginia has a lot of that because people will go back time and time again. Uh, so I think in certain period, places, I think you, can, you would have people saying, this is my favorite winery, and I go back all the time. Does anyone else have an example of a favorite winery or what makes it favorite? I wanted to add here um, another issue what the Europeans do a very bad job at are the wine clubs that you have in the US. So where you go always to buy your wines because you're a member of the wine club. Hardly does doesn't exist. It's hardly non, it's not existing. Mm -hmm. They do it a bit in Rioja where the companies would have their uh, firm brands, uh, you know, their logo on the on the on the barrel, and for their bigger clients and for their top managers, they have their barrels there and their amounts of of bottles per year. But everywhere else in Germany or France, the, the smaller regions, they do horribly bad job in in wine clubs, basically not existing. I, I'm just aware we've got nine minutes, so I have seen. If we get time, no, I'm, I'm actually pointing to the person behind you now. He's got the yeah. I see. Oh. But yeah, okay. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just see. Um, Nat Nat Natalia, just the third question was, um, and I think we're kind of already touching on that, but yeah. I know that you had some thoughts about do you think they are the tourists are expecting different experiences in old and new world? Why? I can only compare, like, because I did some research in the new world and old world, and I think the big, I was thinking about this, what's the biggest, if I have to define one distinguishing factor, because we talked about several things. I would say if I were to define wine, one, I would say that it's the fun factor, or what I call the Disney factor. Um, we, just to give you an example, um, we, I couldn't talk, I, I couldn't um, contribute to the discussion of the heritage because I we work and do research in West Texas and we don't have much wine heritage over there. But we do have a lot of fun. And just to give you an example, we have a winery, it's one of the oldest and biggest winery in Texas, and the owner of that winery is uh, a guy who is of Italian origin, and he's, he's very Italian, and um, he's also very uh, smart in terms of marketing. So what he does, he builds his brand in, around his personality. And one of the things that he does, he wears this red uh, cap. It's like a text driver cap, you know, and he wears it everywhere he goes. Mm. And sometimes he even wears a red suit. And it's a marketing thing. Is it Nicky Lauda? No, it's okay. it's not. It's Paul Bonarigo. But um, but that's his brand, and just to, to that's how his winery is being identified with. And so if you, what, what's interesting when because I am fan of his Facebook 
page. And what I noticed is they started selling the caps, the red cap caps, in the winery. And people buy them and take pictures of themselves and post on Facebook. So that personality is kind of, you know, that, that's his brand. But when I give this example in the presentations in the old world, and I tell people this is how this is an example how you can build your brand, your story based on the personality, they always tell me it's never going to work in, in, in you know well, it's never going to work in Europe. That's not true. I mean, there's, there's some uh, Robert de Villain is a key personality for the many continents. But he doesn't go around in a red cap. No, no, no. I mean, you can do the personality. Well, you can have them yeah. all the time. Yeah. And everybody knows somebody has a hat. I, I think it's a different. Well, I think it does happen in the old world, but it's done in a more European, European button up, exactly, restrained way. Exactly. You, can, you can build your brand around the personality of a winemaker, but it's almost, this is almost like a, everybody wants to take a picture of him, with him. And this is almost like when, exactly like, like celebrity when you go to Disney World, you know, and you want to take a picture with the Mickey Mouse. It's, 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 I mean, in a, in a marketing way, it's a good, it's a good example how that is very different. I think to me that is uh, the major difference. And then if I, um, and and the, and also going back to what we were already talking about, the hospitality and the role of wine. Also, I think that's the uh, that's the second point we kind of started talking about it last night. Uh, that um, whether or not wine is primary or secondary in that experience, you know, um, the winery that we went last night, it was completely set up as a tourist experience. You could see the chairs even lined up evenly with the, you know, so that people can just sit and watch and so um, see the vineyards and the beautiful oh, scenery. For, it's almost like an Instagram winery, you know, it's a winery set up to be, you, you know, um, and so this is not what you see when, when, when you have an old world uh, wine experience. Just uh, there was one over here. You, you no, were, it was just no. this afternoon, in a, a couple hours, we're going to one of those yeah. personality wineries that are so famous in Napa Valley, and they, they seem to work so well. And it is quite different than the old world. But I do want to bring up one other thing. There's, uh, we're missing sort of the difference between uh, international tourism, wine tourism, and local wine tourism. We have local wine tours that come up in the Hudson Valley four or five times a year for events and all sorts of things. And they are local. Mm -hmm. uh, they identify with that part of the country. Yeah. They say, this is my land, mm -hmm. I'm so proud of it because we have these beautiful vineyards, uh, etc. I think that's actually a good point. I don't know that our, our research has addressed this so much. Mm -hmm. The people who will go in Western Australia, where we used mm -hmm. to live, to the Margaret River or the Swan Valley because it's their place, but who, if they went east, wouldn't bother to go to the Barossa Valley or the Yana Valley. They're not so interested in wine, they're interested in wine within their state or their region or their place. It's an identity, uh, place is yeah. a, a part of identity. Certainly yeah. so, so in France we have a lot of people who would, in Burgundy, who would go to various domains in Burgundy or down to Beaujolais or up to Chablis to buy wine. But if they go overseas they wouldn't dream of visiting a winery. That's not, it doesn't yeah. feature within their idea of of wine consumption and experience. Yeah, and, and it's sort of the involvement issue too, because I mean, if, if you're going to make a whole effort to go across the ocean because you're interested, and, and there are some, a lot of people that will do that, but, you know, that specifically go all that way, whereas the local tourists that we, you know, certainly in, in Texas, we have Austin and San Antonio right next to the Texas Hill Country where all the wineries are. So people go out for a day. It's, it's a real low involvement kind of experience. Yeah. And yeah. Something that's just, it, 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 it doesn't cost you a lot. You go visit and just look around. I suspect, sorry, just a quick comment. I suspect there is probably an inverse relationship between proximity to a wine region and a major centre of population and the involvement of the people who go there. But, sorry, Jen. I was just thinking one example that kind of ties all these like old world, new world, and Instagrammable Disneyland, and also international that would be champagne. And I remember going to one of the champagne houses, and I was like, oh my god, I felt like it was I was on a Disneyland yeah. ride, and I was just I I was just, I was just really shocked. And so champagne has so many different. It's, the, it's, it's some of it is new world wine tourism in the old world. Yeah. Right, right. And so it brings together all these issues. And I'm aware of the time. The bus is going in two minutes. So my well, I just was going to let you have a, you had... Oh, okay. So, so uh, I, I just wanted to make the point that in, in the research that was provided me, one of the other things that 
not not the uh, not the experienced wine goers, but the enthusiastic ones, were looking for were brew pubs. So they specifically mentioned brew pubs, and it occurs to me, and I'll pose this question to you all. I don't know of anybody, family, friends, or acquaintances, who go to wineries and sit around and drink wine. They'll go to wineries and taste it. They'll go to wineries and drink it with food they buy in restaurants. But every one of my friends, <laughs> including me, go to brew pubs and sit there and drink beer, partially because it's made on the premises. Uh, well, not all day long, but for quite a long time. <laughs> and so what is the difference between beer and wine? I don't, I don't understand that consumption. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference. But anyway, thank you so much. I mean, for the last few 